me. So good afternoon uh, to everyone. Welcome to this uh, webinar organized uh, by CESPI and uh, GAR. Um, as a final step of a research project funded by the Italian Ministry of Foreign Affairs International Cooperation. First of all, I, I want to, uh, I, I would like to, to thank all participants and in particular uh, the panelists who agreed to contribute, contribute in uh, today's reflection. In, in, in 2019, uh, CESPI uh, founded this, uh, uh, the, um, an observatory on Turkey uh, that is coordinated by um, Valeria Giannotta. Um, starting from the, the awareness uh, the, um, that uh, Turkey is a, a central country uh, in regional dynamics uh, and uh, is a st strategic country also in relation to Europe and Italy, not only from a, a, only an economic point of view, but uh, on, on different issues. So for re this reason, we, we believe that um, it was necessary to strengthen, uh, to strengthen the, the, the knowledge of, of, this, uh, of this country, um, of his internal and, and external dynamics. So in, in this uh, uh, framework uh, um, was born the, the, the project, the, the research project um, that we presented today uh, that is focused on, on a central issue uh, on the international agenda, uh, on the European uh, foreign policy, and uh, also in, in the relation between Turkey and Europe and Turkey and, and Italy in particular, the, the issue of refugee. Um, um, as you know, uh, a few days ago, um, uh, the Europe announced uh, more or less 6 billion of euro to be allocated to the countries that uh, are more involved in the refugee crisis. One of these uh, is Turkey, uh, together with, with the, uh, Jordan and, and that country. Uh, the, the paper that, that we discussed today um, analyzed the, the last deal um, uh, of, uh, of refugee between Turkey and uh, Europe in a wider perspective, uh, looking at the migration issue uh, and in relation uh, um, to, the, to, the, uh, to the partnership of Europe and, and Turkey on, on, on migration issues. Um, of course, the, the, this uh, uh, issue of migration has been um, at the same time, a space of collaboration between Europe and uh, Turkey, but also a space of uh, friction no? uh, um, be between the, the, the two shores of, of the Mediterranean. Uh, the, the pandemic uh, mitigated the, the friction, but uh, they are still on, on, on the table. So um, the, um, in terms of uh, uh, reducing the number of, of migrants reaching the, 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 the European coast, uh, uh, the, the agreement, the deal uh, has been uh, effective, uh, I think. And uh, um, uh, Turkey uh, remain uh, a, a, an essential junction in European migration policy. But one of the questions that uh, should be interesting to discuss with, with you today is uh, how the, this uh, uh, refugee migration issue uh, could be a way to, uh, to increase, uh, the, to restart, uh, reactivate a process of dialogue between uh, uh, Turkey and Europe and Italy. And another issue, uh, I think is in, an important open issue uh, uh, concerns the effectiveness uh, of the deal, uh, not only in terms of number of migrants that 
that uh, uh, reach the, the, the European coast, but in, in terms of uh, uh, real integration of refugees uh, in, in Turkish territory and uh, uh, about the future of the refugee in respect of the hypothesis of return to, to Syria, for example. I think that this is another uh, important issue in terms of uh, uh, sustainability uh, in the long term of the European strategy uh, uh, on uh, migration uh, issue. So uh, the idea is to um, uh, present uh, all these uh, uh, um, uh, this issues, the different approach, point of view uh, that the paper uh, um, uh, explain in, uh, in, uh, in a clear way. Um, the idea is uh, to, to start from uh, um, Valeria, Valeria Giannotta, uh, the director of the observatory in Turkey, um, uh, just to give us the, uh, the, the, the framework of the project and the, the relevance of the project. Uh, then we, uh, I, I'll, I'll give the, the floor to um, Mrs. Danish. Uh, director of GAR um, that will, will provide us a, 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 an idea, a comprehensive reading of the, of the deal. Um, Aurora Yanni, the Chespi researcher, uh, Mediterranean area, um, will give us a, the, the, an idea of the uh, Turkey-European relation uh, with a special focus, of course, on uh, refugee issues. And finally, um, Mrs. Uh, Meral, um, uh, we focus on the financial instruments and technical aspects of, of the deal. And finally, um, I give the floor to Lorenzo Vai and uh, uh, Mr. Piero Fassino uh, in order to um, give us uh, the, the point of view of the Italian uh, foreign ministry and the Italian uh, parliament in terms of opportunity uh, and, uh, um, uh, uh, and uh, um, challenges that the, the, this issue um, uh, represents for Italy. So, uh, Valeria, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Daniele. And thanks to all uh, participants to be here today uh, around this table, which I consider a very high quality table. A special thanks to Mr. Lorenzo Vai, who is representing the unit of uh, analysis and planning of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Italy, which supported our project, and to President Fassino for being with us. Uh, and of course, a special thank to the Dan Danish, who is a very, beside being the director of GAR, he's a very valuable academician in Turkey, one of the most expert on the migration issue and specific, specifically on the so-called uh, refugee deals. A special thanks goes to Meral Achigos, which, uh, who was entitled to address the topic of immigration and migration policy from a more technical point of view, and to our Aurora Yanni, who was uh, uh, in, the, in the first line trying to address this thorny and not easy relationship between Turkey and the European Union. Uh, I will spend just a couple of words before giving the floor to all of you by saying that personally, I've been very uh, proud to coordinate such a work bringing together two of the main think tank, I do believe a center of studies in Italy, which, which are chess being one side and GAR in the other side. Of course, the core of our discussion is the so-called refugee deals, which has been proved to be a, a successful tool, at least an, an efficient tool in order to contain immigration. And as Daniele before said, not more than a week ago, the Council of Europe in uh, 24th of June, decide to extend the financial support uh, to Turkey in order to ease the condition of the so-called refugees present in the country. Uh, how we proceed in order to build this project? Basically, it's obvious that the refugee issue and the migration issue is a thorny issue of common interest, both from a Turkish perspective that, and from the European and Italian perspective as well. As we said, the, the, the so-called deal, the agreement was signed in, the, in, in 2016. 
and uh, this year has turned into the fifth year since the signature. Of course, the process, uh, it wasn't a very easy and linear process. I mean, it was full of frictions and, and both sides had um, something to criticize. Turkey blamed mainly the European counterpart to not fulfill the promise, uh, basically from on the financial front and on the condition of uh, easing the relation, the negotiation between uh, Ankara and Brussels, um, to not uh, um, liberalize the visa requirement for Turkish citizens towards Europe, and to not uh, update, not work enough in updating the custom union. And indeed, all these conditions are still on the table. And as the resolution of the last Council, Council of Europe shows, there is pretty much attention on these, uh, on these elements, uh, without mentioning the negotiation that actually, unfortunately, nowadays, is a, I mean, it experiences sort of deadlock. Indeed, in our project, in order to catch the peculiarity and uh, importance of this uh, deal, we prefer to uh, act starting from an historical and diplomatical perspective, trying to uh, aiming at analyzing the relationship between Ankara, between Turkey and, uh, and Europe. And of course, um, nowadays, there is a negotiation on the table. In 2005, the negotiation process in order to have Turkey as a full membership within the European Union has started. And as soon as the negoci negotiation has started, the main issues uh, uh, came up. And those issues are still. Uh, are still there. And let me say that over the year, they became bigger and bigger and they try and they unfortunately invalidate further this, uh, uh, this path, which is considered a sort of a fluctuating path. And even the, the level of uh, mutual trust between Turkey and European Union has been uh, experiencing a, a sort of ups and downs. When I refer to the main uh, critical issues, uh, the first issue is definitely the, the problem of the island of Cyprus, that uh, Cyprus was accepted as a full membership uh, member within the European Union in 2005, just a couple of months bef before the Turkey started the accession negotiation. And this, of course, has invalidated the majority of the, the main chapters of the negotiation process. Over time, of course, the issue became bigger and bigger. And as it is evident in front of our eyes, and it was evident overall last year, uh, along the most assertive uh, and muscular approach of, of the Turkish foreign policy, the issue from a, a bilateral perspective, it became not only an European issue, but a, a regional issue as well, if not an international issue. But going back to the negotiation process, of course, that was the main core of the problems that invalidate most of the chapters uh, related to, to Turkey. Besides that, of course, the, the relationship between Turkey and European Union experienced several stages. Uh, I will say that when the negotiation started, and even the, the period before the negotiation, the so-called pre-accession moment, uh, Turkey was pretty much busy, it had a pretty much busy agenda in applying some internal reforms in order to get to fulfill the criteria of the so-called acquis communitaire. Uh, once the negotiation, then 10 years after the negotiation has, uh, has started, the main problems, as I mentioned before, arise, arose. And uh, the, after 2016, uh, which was actually a very terrible year, for Turkey do some internal crisis and lastly the coup attempt and uh, related uh, deterioration of the situation of human rights and rule of law domestically, the, the frictions between Turkey and the European Union became much more evident. Indeed, if we read the last uh, progress report by the European Commission, they are pretty much harsh towards Turkey in these regards. And uh, even the European Parliament called several times to stop actually to halt the negotiation process. 
which is, uh, in my opinion, a, a just a cosmetic call because, as I, as I said before, the negotiation process has already experienced a sort of deadlock. Within this uh, frame of, uh, uh, let, let me say, not easy relationship between Turkey and European Union, of course, the migration policy um, has a, a, an important place. Um, Turkey has been is a is one of the main transit countries, so it's been a, as a sort of front line in uh, containing the migration. And from the technical point of view, uh, already before the the signature of the so-called refugee deals, some uh, financial instrument have been implemented. Let's call uh, let's um, that they are called the IP instrument, so the instrument of, of uh, uh, pre-accession humanitarian assistance. And after that, some other uh, financial uh, tools called FRIT, they were, uh, they were put in place. But about this part, Meral, who is the expert, will address the topic, I believe, uh, more in detail. Um, before concluding, I would just um, to, to mention a couple of points. Like, it's true that the uh, refugee deals proved to be a successful, let me say, um, efficient tool. And of course, uh, it was an efficient tool in, during the emergency time. Nowadays in Turkey, there is no uh, emergency anymore let me pass this term about the about refugees the refugees are part of the turkish society now i mean there there are syrians uh, boys and girls that they were born already in turkey 10 11 years ago already that they are accessing the school and as daniele said nowadays there are several issues that are coming up first of all issues of social inclusion the, the, the issue of employment, even now that Turkey is experiencing a very uh, bad economic crisis, those topics, um, I mean, gives us some uh, gives us some concerns. And then there is the urgent need of supporting the hosting community as well. So, um, I mean, we will use this uh, this uh, this project that we carefully drafted together as a yes as a roadmap in order to read and to get to fulfill the gap of knowledge existing in Italy and in Europe uh, towards this uh, towards this instrument. But we will use even as a starting point for a further discussion related to what will come next after the fi five years and 50 years uh, since the signature, what will come next? What we need to expect? I mean, Turkey is ready, has the full capability in dealing with, uh, with the, the, the hot topic of refugees by itself will be enough the support from the European Union. And this kind of relationship that has been formalized between Turkey and European Union related to the immigrants, uh, to the refugee deals, which I consider a sort of a sectorial uh, cooperation and has been successful, will be the way uh, the world relationship between Turkey and European Union will work in the future. In other words, let me say that Turkey nowadays is still a candidate member of the European Union despite several problems, but it seems that Europe, the Europe and European Union is looking at Turkey sometimes at something else than a member of a candidate member of European Union. And uh, uh, I think for the next future, we need to clarify all these, uh, all these points. But I do believe that the Dem Danish, the Demoja will be more, uh, um, will give more detail in this regard. Uh, once more, I would like to congratulate uh, Aurora and Meral once more for the big effort that they put in, uh, in uh, for, for this project and to thank all of you for being here with us today. I will give the floor back to you. Thank you very much. I'm also very happy of being here and um, so that GAR, our association, has been part of this project uh, together with Chespi. So I believe it is really very important for knowledge producers as well to work internationally. So if you allow me, I will use my uh, slides um, to be uh, 
to, 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 to realize my presentation on time. Um, I don't know if I can make it. Yeah, just a minute. Yeah. Yes, so uh, again, thank you very much for uh, cooperating with GAR and producing, especially to uh, Aurora and Meral for creating, writing these wonderful uh, uh, papers. So I just want to, I know that I have very limited time, so I will be very quick. Uh, at the very beginning, I just want to say a few more general uh, things on the uh, what has happened around the eu Turkey statement. Actually, this statement is one of the instances in which contemporary global inequalities become crystallized. And it laid bare the asymmetrical power relations between EU member states and the countries that are in the periphery of Europe. In our case, of course, it's Turkey. But it also uh, showed us and reinforced the inequalities between states and refugees themselves. So what was the road that goes uh, to the EU-Turkey statement? Uh, as many of you can remember, uh, more than a million migrants arrived in Europe in 2015. Most of them uh, were the ones who fled conflicts in Syria, Afghanistan, and Iraq. Turkey, on the other hand, was already the country hosting the highest number of refugees worldwide for the second time in 2015. According to the data of the European Commission, almost 900,000 people passed through Turkey to Greece in this period. This human mobility was then called the refugee crisis and created a very strong anti-refugee atmosphere in many European countries. So in search of a, a solution, political solution, the EU authorities started negotiating with Turkey in order to manage the so-called refugee crisis and control the migration. On November 24, 2015, the EU Commission decided to prepare the fleets. Uh, later on, uh, on November 29, in the EU-Turkey summit, it was decided to put into effect the joint action plan, which aims to strengthen cooperation on supporting Syrian refugees and Turkey. However, this plan didn't reduce irregular migration flows as intended. And looking for a more comprehensive solution, EU and Turkey lately announced on March 18, the famous statement, uh, the agreement they made. So what was the content of the deal? Uh, as of 20 March 2016, it was decided that all new irregular migrants crossing from Turkey to the Greek islands will be returned to Turkey. And for every Syrian returned to Turkey, one Syrian will be resettled to EU countries. This is the famous one-to-one -one formula. I know that all of you know very well, but I just want to remind very quickly. On the other hand, Turkey should take the necessary measures to prevent the formation of new uh, irregular migration routes by sea or land to the EU. So the role of the Turkey was to control irregular migrants, migration. Uh, and, uh, uh, and in return, uh, the statement included revitalizing Turkey's EU accession process, provided that the guaranteed criteria are met. It promised visa liberalization for Turkish citizens and the update of the customs union. Uh, it has also said that when the irregular migration uh, is greatly reduced or ended, it has been decided to implement the voluntary humanitarian admission plan, which EU member states will participate on a voluntary basis. Actually, almost all these uh, items, uh, apart from the uh, uh, control of the irregular migration to a great extent, have been unfulfilled. Uh, the only uh, realized, totally realized aspect has been the uh, 3 billion euro, which uh, the EU has committed to accelerate the payment of the 3 billion euro initially under the Fritz uh, funds and to activate an additional 3 billion by the end of 2018. Uh, from a very general perspective, uh, the statement which came into effect uh, as an attempt uh, to prevent the mass movement is considered as a typical example of EU externalization policies. And this, uh, we wrote a report on our association website. You can reach it. I will share the uh, link uh, with you. Because we see that, uh, I argue in this report that uh, the externalization attempts of EU actually has been received or reacted by Turkey as an instrumentalization uh, uh, 
activity. Uh, and uh, I will give some more examples on this topic. Uh, throughout these five years, since 2016, there have been various political tensions between Turkey and EU. Uh, it has been either due to the um, and disagreements over visa liberalization or financial commitments, or for instance, the crisis in the Eastern Mediterranean in 2018, or the Turkish military operations in Northern Syria. Uh, so in each of these international issues, Turkish authorities in Turkey have used as a diplomatic leverage uh, the, 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 the threat of uh, opening the borders. Here I share with you the speech by the president of Turkey that he made public and he made a public speech in October 2019 after the Operation Peace Spring. And he clearly says that we opened the, the doors and sent 3.6 million refugees to you. You, EU, are making many calculations. They wouldn't send the second installment of 3 billion euros. Have you feel full, fulfilled your promise so far, et cetera, et cetera. So this has been really a major issue uh, on the EU-Turkey relations uh, in the last five years. A very typical example is the Pazar Kule, Edirne incidents that happened on March 2020. You can see the pictures, uh, many of you can remember very well. It has started after the killings of more than 30 Turkish soldiers in Idlib. And then Turkey announced, the Turkish authorities announced that uh, they decided not to prevent the crossing of refugees to Europe. And it, uh, at that point, the tensions reached the highest point uh, and the immigrants headed for the Greek border after a while were stuck in the buffer zone between the two countries. So uh, yes, we are right now focusing on the EU-Turkey statements, but actually the EU impact on Turkish migration governance is not new at all. As also uh, you have mentioned at the very beginning, the intergovernmental cooperation between EU and Turkey has been going on in the last two decades. Three main areas of cooperation is border in, uh, development of border infrastructure, improvement of legal and administrative infrastructure, for instance, the creation of law on foreign foreigners and international protection in 2013, or the creation of Directorate General of Migration Management in 2014. And lastly, uh, last but not the least, the increasing activities of international intergovernmental organizations uh, on the migration and asylum field in Turkey. So why I insist that this is not new, because in 2005, uh, with the Turkey's accession process, uh, Turkey announced a national action plan for the adoption of the EU acquis in the field of asylum and migration. The readmission agreements, much before the 2016, have been uh, signed by EU and Turkey uh, in 2013. Here you see a photo from the Harmandala uh, removal center near Izmir. Actually, there is a new cooperation between uh, uh, Turkey, IOM, and UNHCR to improve the removal center's capacity uh, in Turkey with the fund funds uh, provided by the EU. So this is the general scene, but what happens in Turkey? What do we see in the Turkish context? Actually, here, I want to remind you what Roger Zetter uh, has mentioned years ago, more labels, res less refugees. Today in Turkey, we see many different categories regarding the asylum seekers. There are very few uh, Geneva Convention refugees, of course, because of the geographical limitation. There are asylum seekers, conditional refugees, temporary protection status holders, etc. But what makes all this is actually a protection hierarchy. Just look at the case of the, for instance, uh, the general uh, setting. There are, due to the, these different legal statuses, many people are having uh, enduring different living conditions in Turkey. Like as I put here, for instance, the naturalized Syrians, the ones who receive the Turkish citizenship today, are probably the most protected although they are a very small minority. And the least protected, I would say, are the undocumented migrants, such as the Afghans, for instance, the image below you see here, 
uh, is an Afghan undocumented migrant who has no uh, possibility to get access to uh, international protection in Turkey. Or for instance, the picture about a young Syrian uh, boy working on a uh, textile sweatshop in Istanbul because they had no chance to work in Gaziantep, the city she, he was, they were, uh, and reg uh, they were registered. So they have been, uh, although they had a temporary protection status, it was in another city and they have no more chance to benefit from the uh, various uh, services and rights provided by this status. So I, 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 I know that I have very limited time, so I just wanted to finish quickly. But what I want to say is that these different uh, legal statuses uh, provided to uh, people searching for international protection uh, actually creates inequalities in access to basic services. Uh, especially in education and health. Many are unable to get access to uh, these services. Uh, and particularly the discrimination and exploitation in working life makes us to observe the emergence of refugees as the new reserve army of labor in the extensive informal economy of Turkey. And we shouldn't forget that uh, certainly the EU externalization policies has a very important impact on all these new inequalities. And there are many questions that we can discuss with you uh, for the medium and long term, as Valeria already mentioned in her speech. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Didem. Uh, thank you for bringing us the, the uh, different point uh, of view. I mean, the, 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 the Turkish, uh, what's happening in Turkish, uh, reminding that Turkish has uh, managed the, the biggest number of refugees uh, in, in the Syrian crisis, but also at, at, at the world level. And uh, I think uh, uh, two, two very simple elements. One, uh, is the uh, I want to underline the the, the need the, the the importance of uh, um, collaborating between uh, think tanks uh, be, between civil societies uh, Italian and uh, European and Turkish uh, I think that this is an important point of development of the relationship also um, a, a second issue is is more a, a um, political reflection. Uh, coming from your uh, uh, your intervention, uh, uh, the, the question is uh, if uh, the, the right approach uh, on the uh, refugee and migration issue is just to externalize uh, the the, um, uh, the borders or uh, um, uh, engage in a process of real partnership between uh, the, 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 two, the, the, the two countries, no? in, in terms of joint, uh, a, a joint management of migration. I think this is uh, an important issue, uh, maybe uh, um, in, the, in, the, in the last part, uh, we, we, we could uh, uh, go deep in this, uh, in, in this uh, issue. Uh, now I give the floor to Aurora Yanni. Uh, as uh, Valeria introduced, uh, the, the issue uh, of refugee is, uh, is only one of the items of, on the table uh, in, uh, in the relationship between uh, Turkey and Europe. So um, Aurora um, you can give, give us a, a, an overview of the relation between Europe and, and Turkey and uh, um, focus on, on this uh, um, refugee issue. Valeria, please. Okay. <laughs> uh, thanks a lot, first of all, uh, to all of you for this uh, amazing opportunity uh, for discussing the result of our research, which was, uh, as uh, already mentioned, on the topic of the refugee issue between uh, uh, Turkey and the European Union relations. 
Relations that, as uh, Valeria has already mentioned, are long lasting and dates back already. Um, I would say also before the 1999 Helsinki summit, uh, also during the 50s, uh, um, the uh, Turkey joined the um, Council of Europe uh, and also the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. And during the 60s also, and this is very much important, um, there has been a lot of commitment in order to strengthen the uh, economic cooperation between the parts with the Ankara Agreement that then uh, was aimed at uh, achieving the uh, well-known customs union. Um, but um, to try uh, like to put some highlights uh, uh, in terms of uh, relations between the party in 10 minutes. I've tried to do my best. Uh, many things have been said already. Um, I would say that uh, um, as we started with our uh, like research, uh, um, we focused first of all on a period in which uh, there was a lot of cooperation between the parts since uh, uh, 1999 to 2005 indeed. Um, it was clear that after Turkey was declared um, a candidate eligible to be a candidate state uh, to join the European Union, um, there was a clear commitment in the year that followed uh, from the European perspective to enlargement and from Turkish per perspective to uh, um, like align uh, to the European Union institutional standards um, and thus uh, a process of reform started and get to the uh, 2005 uh, official declaration of uh, uh, the accession process, accession negotiation between the parts. Um, I would say that since then, since the very beginning of the negotiation process, uh, um, at least uh, with regard to the accession negotiation, uh, the process has been an obstacle course since the very beginning, because as Valeria have already has already mentioned, the um, in 2006 already, uh, after one year since the launch of the official negotiation process, eight chapters of the negotiation were blocked due to um, the fact that, uh, uh, let's say, um, Turkey was uh, partially applying the additional protocol to the um, southern part of the island of Cyprus, which is still like divided in two parts. And uh, I would say also that this kind of uh, issue um, has uh, to some extent accompanied the challenges between uh, um, that also marked to some extent the challenges also between um, this uh, relation also if we consider then um, lately um, this uh, like issue as to some extent broadened into a regional um, like um, I would say uh, a regional uh, uh, issue over gas exploration towards uh, the Eastern Mediterranean and uh, also led the European Union to um, impose sanctions to, uh, to Turkey uh, in the light of such activities. Uh, problem also were raised and concern were raised from the European side, especially since 2013, also um, on the topic of um, like the state of the rule of law the state of democracy in the country, the state of human rights, but also um, over the fact that Turkey was like carrying out a military operation that, as uh, Didem has mentioned already, uh, were presented from the one side as a kind of, I would say, uh, response also to some uh, um, like unattended promises from the European Union. And on the other side, uh, it was uh, perceived as uh, kind of uh, actions in breach of the European, uh, of the European values. Uh, that said, um, the area, whether considering that uh, about the accession process, the negotiation are still frozen and are frozen since uh, 2016, 16 chapters out of the 35 of the negotiation are opened with only one of them closed. And also due to all of these challenges, like we are in this kind of stalemate, 
But um, I would say also that uh, um, cooperation on migration have never cheesed, uh, as, Meral, uh, as uh, Didem also underlined, like uh, thanks to the, um, since the very beginning of the negotiation process, also thanks to the um, instrument of pre-accession, um, that are instruments that are usually like used to um, um, assist the candidate country in order to make reforms, uh, internal reforms, in order to get then the Afri Communitaire. Uh, but um, in terms of, uh, uh, in the framework of this instrument, also in Turkey, there has been a lot of reforms uh, um, about uh, like the migration management. And uh, also there has been a lot of cooperation already before 2016, in 2013, but I think that um, like um, also before 2013, there was kind in the air, uh, the necessity of uh, um, developing kind of readmission agreements and linking them to some kind of offers, I would say, such as uh, the starting of the visa liberalization dialogue and then the 2016 um, deal, which uh, uh, I would just say uh, on this uh, like topic that, that will be like further addressed by uh, Meral, that uh, um, the deal is mutually acknowledged in terms of a success in terms of, sorry, um, in terms of reduction of irregular migration, but there are a lot of challenges as we have already listened. Um, and also um, there are a lot of claims from the Ankara perspective towards also the disbursement of funds, uh, which anyway, yeah, it's a challenge, but also we have also to consider that under the facility, there are a lot of best practices financed, uh, such as, uh, as an example, the emergency social and safety net, uh, which targeted around 1.8 million uh, of, of refugees with cash assistance. Um, so basically, going to the conclusion, I would say that uh, cooperation, to some extent, can be considered a success story and a success area of cooperation between the parts, whether considering all of the challenges and whether considering that there is a lot to improve. But the thing is that um, it seems like to me that since already uh, 2011, when after the outbreak of the Syria crisis, um, the fact that Turkey was like started to be seen as a transit country, uh, the, the biggest transit country, I would say, from uh, Syria to the European shores and lands, um, to some extent has raised concern about um, possible threats of massive influx of refugees that was like massive in 2015, but already like ongoing before. Um, and all of this led um, the European Union kind of uh, prioritizing, I would say, um, the externalization of border or at least considering it more urgent than uh, uh, enlargement. I stop here. Thank you, Aurora. Thank you very much. Um, now I give the floor to Omeral uh, Rachikors, um, that uh, researcher of uh, GAR with a, a, a great experience. Uh, she worked for uh, IOM, OEM, the International uh, Organization for Migration. Uh, she was part of the team at the Ministry of Interior in uh, uh, that draft the law on uh, uh, foreigners and international pro um, protection. And uh, uh, she developed also to, uh, in, uh, uh, in the team with the government, the uh, Turkey's first strategy documents and national action, action plans on uh, integration and uh, irregular migration. And uh, she, she will go deeper in the, um, uh, on, the, on the deal in the technical and financial instruments. And please, uh, what what worked and what didn't work? You know, uh, thinking to the new deal, uh, what uh, need an improvement uh, from uh, the, the the point of view of the um, Turkish uh, society and the Turkish uh, government? Uh, please, Meral, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. 
Meral, you have to activate the microphone. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. Uh, uh, thank you uh, very much for this kind introduction uh, and hello everyone. Uh, before starting with my presentation, I, I would like to uh, thank uh, to Valeria and Oraro and Chespi. Uh, it was a great pleasure to working with them. Uh, and I, was, I also appreciate having the opportunity to work um, on this project for the GAR. Um, GAR, uh, with their valuable work in Turkey, highly contribute to migration research in Turkey. So I uh, would like to thank um, GAR uh, for their valuable work. Uh, today, I'll talk about the role of uh, financial and technical assistance of the EU uh, to Turkey in the field of migration and asylum and in its impact on EU-Turkey relations. I will first briefly mention the period during, the, during which EU supported Turkey's emerging migration management efforts through the IPA instrument. As Didem has explained, this period is, to, is key to shed light on the current relations dynamic, as I believe the seeds for today's um, EU-Turkey cooperation's approach have been sown back in that period. Then I will talk about the second, second period that starts with the mass influx of refugees to Turkey. During this period, the main financial assistance has been the EU's facility for refugees in Turkey that was adopted after the joint action plan uh, between the EU and Turkey. Uh, this is shortly called FRIT. Um, and this has been one of the um, other humanitarian and development assistance channel to Turkey the, since the start of this crisis. Regarding the methodology of the paper, um, the paper or my part mainly based on a desk research, except a written feedback that we have received from the Turkey's free chief coordinator under, under the vice presidency office or shortly BPO and my interview uh, with an official from the EU delegation to Turkey responsible for the coordination of the FRIT. Let me start uh, with the first period. Um, as Didem and Orara mentioned, Turkey's candidate uh, status for the EU um, in 1999, uh, since this period, um, EU has provided financial and technical assistance to Turkey, mainly through the IPA funding and uh, this uh, funding covered the periods of 2017 and 2013 and 2014 to 2020. Uh, in mid-2000s, uh, IPA funds uh, mainly supported Turkey to undertake necessary institutional and legal reforms on migration and uh, asylum and these efforts were resulted in the adoption of the Turkey's first um, comprehensive law on asylum and migration in 2013. Um, and this law is called Law on Foreigners and International Protection. Although the financial and technical cooperation between the EU and Turkey produced beneficial results, as in the case of this law, this cooperation um, has not been shaped by Turkey's EU candidacy that required Turkey to reform its system uh, in line with the EU Aki. Um, uh, but uh, as Didem also mentioned, uh, in this cooperation, um, the irregular migration, increasing number of irregular migrants passing through uh, to Europe through Turkey since mid 1990s uh, play a key role in this cooperation and the re readmission agreement uh, signed in 2013. Uh, can be regarded as a milestone in this uh, relationship because uh, with this agreement, uh, we see, clearly see that the strategic use of migration diplomacy as a bargaining tool over the over and during the implementation and during the membership negotiation process between EU and Turkey. And this negotiation process, as, as some argue, that regressed the greater candidacy, candidacy, uh, candidacy debate. Um, and in this uh, sense, this agreement has become the most visible instrument in EU-Turkey relations to shift the EU's migration management responsibilities, including refugee protection beyond its border or as commonly known externalization of its policies, as Didan has perfectly explained. Uh, furthermore, some scholars argue uh, that migration governance adopted by the law on foreigners and international protection and it is differentiated legal status 
among migrants and refugees also brings a more rigid structure than before. And this is made um, may, mainly to align the EU's um, uh, to a technocr technocratic approach, which is um, widely criticized by, uh, by, uh, by scholars working in this field. Uh, regarding the amount of EU's financial assistance extended for Turkey uh, under the IPA and uh, two, uh, Turkey used 9.3 uh, billion euro for all sectors, including asylum and migration sector that is uh, formerly called home affairs sector. I tried to uh, detail the coverage of these funds in the paper. I can just uh, mention that it's, it has not been easy to indicate the total amount of uh, IPA, IPA funds allocated for this sector per se, due to the allocation modality of the funds and non-availability of open sources that is being regularly uh, updated. Based on my communication with the EU delegation, uh, the colleagues at the EU delegation and my rough calculations, I got some indicative figures uh, and uh, under IPA one period, over 110 uh, million euro was provided for funding of 22 projects uh, in, under the asylum and migration se sector. Under IPA uh, two period, over uh, um, uh, 92.5 million euro was provided for funding of 14 projects. I should also mention that IPA requires the co-funding of the uh, candidate countries and Turkey also contributes to these projects. Uh, it's also worth mentioning that during this period, EU, uh, um, apart from the EU's financial assistance, with the establishment of DGMM, donor portfolio diversified and Turkey uh, through DGMM uh, received um, other funds uh, bilaterally from, other, uh, from member states uh, bilaterally or other non-EU member states uh, through uh, mainly uh, partners uh, that are uh, UN agencies or uh, civil society organizations, etc. cetera. Uh, DGMM, uh, uh, reports uh, in their website uh, the the number of the projects that they have completed uh, so far, and uh, there are uh, 858 completed projects, including IPA projects, and also they have uh, 25 ongoing projects. So there is a like a very projectized approach, and EU funds and uh, uh, not only freight, there's through IPA and other bilateral funds, um, Turkey Turkey financed their work on asylum and uh, migration sector, uh, but um, the DGMM doesn't uh, give any financial information in their uh, in these uh, lists. Um, uh, for EU-Turkey -Tur relations, um, another turning point was, of course, the mass influx of Syrian refugees into Turkey. And in response to this influx, financial assistance, or in other words, international humanitarian aid, started uh, by 2012, uh, but uh, allocation of funds to Turkey um, increased rapidly by uh, 2017, mainly due to this migratory flows from Turkey to EU, as we all know. Uh, I uh, again tried to compile all humanitarian funds channeled to Turkey since the, since the start of the crisis, but this has been also a bit challenging. The financial tracking service of OCHA uh, database, there's a database, gives some indications, but it is not possible to extract data showing cumulative amount of funding per country, per donor, or per year. Uh, since um, this uh, tool compiles that data is uh, on, only compiles only reported data, and on top of that, uh, not all of the donors or receiving institutions reports their uh, funding uh, uh, at the same time for this uh, um, website. And on top of that, the way how the donors or receiving organizations report the funds. Uh, differ as per their financial year or uh, etc. Uh, so I cannot really tell, uh, yeah, uh, you know, uh, uh, the total amount of the funding channeled to Turkey since the start of the crisis. 
the need assessment report drafted uh, for the faculty in 2018 tried to give uh, this um, information uh, and they have got in uh, they got in touch with the, the donors separately to get this information and they compiled uh, a, a figure but again this is uh, not an um, up to date anymore outdated and there have been some countries didn't respond to this um i am talking about this because it is important actually while uh, we are talking about the impact of um funds uh including free and other donors funds and government's efforts as well uh, it is important to get uh, have this um, picture but unfortunately uh, besides free uh, funds we don't have a very comprehensive picture in terms of donors, um, of donors finance, uh, main donors, uh, we can say based on this OCHA's database, the uh, the FRIT, um, US, Germany, UK, Japan, and Kuwait are the leading uh, donors. Um, in Turkey, uh, besides FRIT, before talking about more on uh, FRIT, uh, United Nations response to Syrian refugee crisis through, through regional refugee response plan, uh, it's called 3RP, and uh, its donor coordination mechanism played also a significant role in external funding management uh, to the crisis. Uh, in Turkey, the first uh, 3RP country plan was prepared for the years of 2015 and 16. And after the establishment of the FRIT, EU has become the main donor for the appeals, including Turkey country chapter. As per the 3RP funding update uh, of January uh, 2021, uh, based on the appeal of the 1.3 billion, um, you, uh, 695 billion uh, million uh, received. There is a uh, like a half of, uh, of it uh, remains as a gap. And uh, since in its introduction, uh, TRP's introduction in Turkey in 2015, has uh, TRP has contributed to contribute mobilization of approximately uh, 4.5 billion um, euro, uh, uh, sorry dollar to date. Um, but uh, I should uh, mention that 2015 migration crisis or so-called EU's migration refugee crisis has dramatically changed the scale and modality of the financial assistance extended for Syrians in Turkey. I'll uh, not go into detail of the events unfolded and EU's response and negotiation between, and, between Turkey and uh, EU that led to the uh, sig uh, signature of the EU-Turkey statement uh, as this has been covered by um, Gidem and Orara before and uh, you can find more information in the uh, part of my uh, presentation but I would like to talk about more in more about the FRIT because it seems this will uh, be the uh, the FRIT will continue in the upcoming years as well as a main financial instrument supporting refugees in Turkey. Um, the facility uh, coordinated financing from different EU funding mechanisms, uh, namely humanitarian aid operated by ECHO, the European Neighborhood Instrument, uh, Instru uh, IPA, uh, uh, EU Re Regional Trans uh, Tra Trust Fund, uh, and among others. Uh, this, this nature of the facility uh, to coordinate the mobilization of EU budget and member state resources and the operate uh, existing instrument in parallel makes it a bit complex uh, funding mechanism and operation. Uh, and this uh, has received some uh, criticism from Turkish government. Uh, the facility has also a steering committee, uh, which is chaired by the commission and it includes representatives from all EU member states. Turkish representatives participate to the committee meetings and in an advisory capacity and take part in the decisions related to implementation, implementation of the support. But the Office of Turkey's free chief coordinator under the vice president of Office VPO uh, reported for this report, uh, report that since the EU has the ultimate authority uh, for managing uh, the funds and actions, Turkey is not sufficient, or they believe that Turkey is not sufficiently involved in decision making, uh, making mechanism, and Turkey doesn't have enough authority in the project selection and implementation processes. 
Uh, Philips uh, coordinated, the, as you all know, the mobilization of a total budget of 6 billion euro. The amount was mobilized in two trenches, amounting a total of 3 billion for the period of 2016-17 and uh, further 3 billion for the period of 2018 and 19. As uh, per the uh, fourth annual report of the FRIT, um, the projects under uh, this first tranche will continue until mid-20 uh, this year, and uh, the second tranche will continue, projects will continue 2025 20, at the latest. Uh, and uh, as per their information, all operational funds have been committed and contracted under both tranches and more than 4 billion uh, euro dis dispersed by um, this December 2020. Uh, and uh, in addition to this 6 billion, EU has allocated over uh, uh, 500 million uh, euros uh, for the for uh, Fritz two flagship flagship projects, which are uh, about social assistance and uh, in the field of social assistance and education. These are quite big uh, projects, and they, they this additional fund will help uh, these uh, projects to uh, to be run until the early. To, uh, 2020, uh, uh, 22. Uh, and uh, regarding this budget, uh, VPO office uh, inform uh, our research that this allocated fund doesn't match the need assessment, uh, the, the amount indicated in the 2018 uh, need assessment, as well as the, uh, the, the emerging needs uh, due to COVID-19 pandemic. And according to VPO, they need approximately 3 billion euro more. Uh, and with the, uh, as you mentioned, uh, with the latest declaration of the announcement of EU, EU plans to allocate further 3 billion to Turkey. And this means that the, uh, Turkey uh, will receive, uh, will, uh, you know, uh, this um, EU will address the, uh, Turkey's um, request um, uh, with, through this uh, allocation. And uh, the, another um, important characteristic of the facility is that the, it is um, implemented with a program-based approach. Although Turkey uh, are initially expected the, uh, cash transfer and wanted some degree of autonomy in using the fund, However, the commission adopted, uh, opted for a program-based approach by setting up the freight and all. The facility uh, and this programming was made, was made based on some need assessment and also some concept uh, notes. Uh, and this project-based approach is, is done through two main strands. One is humanitarian strand, uh, the other one is the development strand. And uh, regarding the implementation of the projects, uh, the VPO, Turkish um, uh, presidency, noted uh, that they find the project implementation process very slow, and they believe that the, the main reasons of delays is related to the fact that EU is applying free projects with a similar logic of the IPA uh, ones, uh, IPA projects, which are implemented through lengthy, very, very bureaucratically cumbersome uh, processes. The EU official interview, uh, the, uh, the, the EU official uh, whom I interviewed for this research highlighted though that assistance provided under this framework um, is project based and it, the pace is, depends on the uh, progress in contracting and implementation of the projects. And furthermore, there is also another report of the European uh, Court of Accounts in 2018, they say, uh, the facility, uh, the projects under the facility were contracted up to five times faster than the traditional IPA assistance in Turkey. And uh, the, free, the, the commission also um, uh, uh, publishes um, a, a list of all projects uh, funded and uh, contracted under, uh, under uh, FRIT. And to date, um, as of, sorry, ter, um, December uh, last year, a total of uh, 112 projects uh, have been implemented through uh, 38 different partners. This is a huge, uh, a, a complex um, uh, uh, operation, I would say, uh, as per as we can see the number of uh, the, the projects and also the partners involved in the implementation of all projects. 
uh, based on this project modality though the funds are uh, disper dispersed to, to as i said uh, earlier through the un agencies civil society organization international financial institutions as well as directly with the governmental agencies mainly health and education and protection sectors for free two uh, we will see two major differences compared to uh, free two one uh, first, uh, there is a progressive shift from humanitarian to development assistance under free two uh, to uh, more like ensure the self-reliance of refugees, uh, strengthen local com uh, communities, capacity host refugees, etc. Uh, for social cohesion. Um, uh, and, uh, and free tools um, um, mainly um, uh, focus on uh, socio-economic development and uh, the, the amount uh, allocated for the development strand under the field two is, is higher than the first uh, trench and um, and also they have found that the administrative cost of the UN agencies in the management of the the social assistance program, the social assistance program, ESSN, uh, became a concern by the government, and they uh, they wanted to respond to this concern. And uh, now uh, the, the UN agencies are not uh, the part of these uh, projects anymore. With the second, uh, with the with the, the latest um, so, uh, call for the social economic uh, development uh, projects, because. Uh, uh, the, the, they, they have uh, introduced a new criteria of limiting under the cost of or the overhead, uh, the international organizations, um, UN agencies applies 7% and they have, they couldn't apply uh, with, uh, with this, uh, this uh, uh, you know, reduced um, overhead. So now uh, there are different partners working on this uh, projects, um, international financial institutions and IFRC are uh, working on this project. Um, I, I would like to conclude uh, uh, my um, speech uh, through also um, reflecting on the future of this, um, uh, this financial assistance mechanism, because I believe there are a few issues, uh, regardless of the modality we chosen, uh, there are a few issues that need to be taken into consideration. First of all, Turkey, as a middle-income country with an established public service delivery system, allows refugees access to public services, and thus Turkey requires support to maintain such access, especially in the economic uh, situation with COVID uh, and in general economic situation in the country. Mainstreaming these services to refugees and migrants as supported by various free programs will remain priority in the near future. As I mentioned before, uh, FIT's flagship uh, projects involve mainly direct grants to the governmental authorities with the potential to produce larger impact on the lives of refugees, as in the case of health and education services. Yeah, I, 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 I mean that I, I kind of um, support the idea uh, that, uh, that the, this mainstreaming is important and that uh, the government should be uh, supported uh, with, through the direct grants. However, uh, we all know that EU also is interested in controlling the funds allocations and disbursement to ensure the, their accountability criteria. As we all know, there is kind of a mistrust between the EU and Turkey when it comes to some accountability issues. And, and also, EU doesn't want to lose the control of their bargaining power. Uh, secondly, uh, FRIT and the future funds will need to focus more on the ref refugees' employment in formal market, um, Didam has mentioned, uh, because uh, this is uh, still remains a big gap and uh, the, the income of refugees are currently depends mainly on social assistance through this ESSM program, as well as very precarious informal employment. A smooth uh, transition from dependence on social assistance schemes uh, to increase the independence and livelihood opportunities uh, is urgently needed. Uh, uh, and given this background, I believe larger involvement of Turkish authorities overseeing macroeconomic realities and better cooperation among the potential partners uh, while managing the future funds is, is key. 
uh, uh, to have and to produce more sustainable solutions to improve the lives of the refugees instead of like a small scale uh, projectized approach uh, 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 focusing more on the uh, on the skill development or or um, uh, vocational employment that etc that was uh, that was the case they are all kind of important but that was mainly the case in the first um, trench uh, uh, the, the projects uh, supported under the first trench of the frit uh, although they had an impact but they didn't really increase the likelihood of employing refugees formally or their uh, labor market participation and income generation activities because there are many as um, uh, did i mentioned there is many uh, macro level structural problems to uh, include refugees into this labor market. Third, uh, the success and impact uh, also, I believe, uh, very much depend on the developing an inclusive medium and long term policies for all migrant groups concerning migrant integration and social cohesion and to, and to prepare Turkish society for this reality. Uh, for example, to, um, the status of Syrians is still temporary. Like nobody talks about the 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 the, the changing uh, and uh, granting more secure st statuses for uh, Syrians. Uh, of course, they can uh, access to rights and services, but uh, th this this situation, this temporariness, prevent them to be entitled for more secure and long term statuses, which are essential for uh, legal integration. Uh, furthermore, in, with increasing focus of funds and programs for Syrians, needs of non-Syrian refugees uh, in terms of improving their living conditions and their access to rights and services have been mostly overlooked, uh, despite of FRITS and other external assistance programs plan focus on both groups. I should just mention that the number of um, non-Syrian refugees living in Turkey is more than uh, 300,000. So we are talking about again a big group, but their priorities, their needs were overlooked uh, throughout the time. Therefore, um, uh, the policies being developed for refugees in Turkey needs to be more inclusive. And I am going to also uh, add that uh, Turkey, uh, as a, a middle income country and a donor itself, can be qualified as a recipient of humanitarian. How long this can go on? Uh, and how long Turkey can use uh, their bargaining power with EU. Um, and so this is also remains the question for me. And uh, lastly, um, until now, except FRIT and other big programs on mountain relation reports, main net output level, you know, how, uh, and this many of uh, refugees uh, benefit from this program, that program, but there is a limited data and research, I believe, analyzing the funds channeled to Turkey since, since the beginning of the crisis, we need such more extensive um, research and analysis uh, to understand the impact of this fund, uh, also in comparison to the government's interventions. Uh, maybe I can also mention about this uh, in the uh, Q&A session, because I am sure now I am, <laughs> I, I pass my time. Uh, so. I will end here and yes, um, thank you so much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much, Miral. Um, you, you, you point uh, a lot of uh, very important issues that uh, I, I think that uh, our discussant uh, uh, will, will approach. I, I just had um, two important two things on uh, uh, I don't know if you agree with me. Uh, one is the, the importance of uh, uh, and, uh, uh, to involve the local uh, uh, the local level uh, the local government uh, in order to uh, to manage the, the, the funds but also to uh, uh, to, to do, um, uh, realize a sort of monitoring of the effectiveness of the uh, of the um, intervention and uh, another point that you you raise uh, that is important for our vote but in, in terms of uh, um, monitoring uh, is the access of data uh, of data uh, and the in order to to give uh, no, to, to give the possibility to uh, to 
um, make a sort of uh, accountability of the funds uh, and of the effectiveness of the funds. So um, I give the floor to Mr. Lorenzo Vai from the Italian Ministry of Foreign Affairs. I just, um, I think that a lot of questions we, we, we have, um, are already on the table. Um, if you want to, to, uh, to react to some, some points, to some uh, elements that uh, uh, was, uh, uh, was raised from, from the discussion now, and uh, uh, what, what is the, the, the Italian point of view in, uh, in terms of uh, the foreign uh, um, Ministry of Foreign Affairs, and what do you think is the, um, uh, the, the, the opportunity and the space for uh, uh, restart uh, a, a, a dialogue with uh, Turkey uh, that is not only a bargaining dialogue, but is, is a real partnership dialogue. Uh, please, Mr. Bai. Thank you, thank you. Do you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, okay, perfect. So good evening and thank you for the invitation and for the contribution from previous speakers. I'll try to save time in order to deal also with the discussion and the question that may arise. Um, I will start saying that we really appreciate the results of the research so in depth and so timely, especially for our work here at the ministry, because uh, as you probably know, the main goal of the financial support gave by the ministry to universities and think tank is to take all the Italian foreign policy priorities uh, offering analysis and policy recommendation at the service of the civil servants and especially decision maker. And I do think that this study um, goes to the heart of this mission. So I thank again Chespi and Gar for their work. Uh, say that I take part of this webinar more as an attentive listener than an active contributor. Nonetheless, let me take the issue from a wider perspective, as we do here at the policy planning unit. Then as a request, I will spend a few words on the Italian perspective and next steps and opportunities for, for the future. Um, first of all, I really appreciate the historical and political reconstruction offered by the study and recalled uh, today by the panelists, because it's important, especially for the future, to be reminded the political path followed by the EU and Turkey that bring us where we are now today. Uh, because looking at the ongoing enlargement process, which involve very different countries, of course, I refer to the Western Balkans, I think that the Turkish case has something to teach, a simple but sometimes forgotten lesson uh, which is that the accession process is not easy. It has to be promoted, followed, and supervised with constancy at any level, both institutional and political. Otherwise, the result can be very different from what we wish. Uh, but focusing on the Syrian and the consequent refugee crisis, I think that the EU is dealing with a clear trade-off, if not a dilemma. We pay the lack of activism of the European Union, or better saying, the lack of the lack of consensus between the 27 member states of the EU and its common capacity. So, more the Syrian crisis continues, the more refugees flow will be an issue for the Europeans. Something that the EU has not been capable to solve alone, both externally and domestically. And here comes Turkey and the 2016 EU-Turkey uh, declaration. So because of this persistent deficiency at the EU level, cooperation on the refugee issue is nowadays the only feasible way uh, to tackle the problem in a pragmatic way. At the same time, as stated by many documents, for example, the EU global strategy, the European way cannot be only pragmatic, as to be based on principle on our European common principle and human rights. So uh, now, is it the idea of a principle, pragmatism, an oxymoron? Well, I don't think so. Uh, taking the Turkish case, uh, principled pragmatism means, for example, from the EU perspective, keep the control on the funds allocation and to ensure they are accountability criteria, criteria and uh, as underlined in the research, not lose control of their bargaining power. So my impression is that the real challenge here is in the details. Uh, the technical framework of the next agreement will be essential 
to design the future of the cooperation and more in general, the dialogue between EU and Turkey uh, at any level, I would say, uh, starting from the protection of human rights and promotion on, of social development. So on this topic, for example, I really appreciate the intervention uh, before me, but also the contribution in the paper was really, really in depth. And uh, I think that this is the main goal of this research. I mean, giving uh, precise and uh, uh, punctual details on technical matters. Uh, where we are now, uh, recent, recently, as many of you probably know, the European Commission uh, shared a paper title addressing the needs of refugees from the C Syria conflict and beyond in view of the next European Council on 24 and 25 of June. Uh, I'm sorry, of, of the last European Council. In this paper, the EU Commission prospects the allocation of 3.5 billion euro, euro to Turkey in order to deal with refugees. At the same time, this proposal does not mean a simple prosecution of the facility for refugees in Turkey and should not be constrained by the 2016 EU Turkish declaration. So following these, the European leaders have invited the Commission to present formal proposal to finance the Syrian refugees hosting countries like Turkey. At the same time, the Council conclusions stress the importance to consider other refugees and migrant routes, like, for example, which is very important for us, for Italy, the central Mediterranean one. So to put it differently, let's pay attention also to other countries like Libya. Um, I think that in the migration field, the cooperation between EU and Turkey has been considered uh, in a way a positive case with several critical points raised by the panelists before me and very well described in the paper. So from a national perspective, I would say that Italy still supports the cooperation between Brussels and Ankara, a cooperation that has to be constantly supervised about the compliance of human rights standard, of course, something that cannot be done without the full and constant involvement of EU institutions. And I would like to add the active role of non-governmental organization operating on the field. Nonetheless, again, from a national perspective, we notice a strong decrease in the migration flows via the Eastern Mediterranean route, less 45% this year respect to 2020. So after Greece, Italy is the second EU country of arrival. So the, man the management of the central Mediterranean route is now the real priority for Italy. And I would say for Europe. In this sense, the well-known Italian proposal is to work together at the European level for a comprehensive and wider EU migration policy, able to deal with different interests and financial efforts. And of course, between this comprehensive and wider EU migration policy, of course, the cooperation between Brussels and Ankara will be, I'm sure, still central and essential. Uh, I would like to stop here and thank you for your attention, but of course, I'm, I'm, I'm able to answer to all your questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Vai. I, I just remember to the participant that you, you can uh, put your question if you have question in the Q&A uh, function. And uh, now I, um, I give the floor to Mr. Piero Fassino, chairman of the Foreign Affairs Committee the, from the Italian Chamber of Deputies. And um, prego, Mr. Fassino. Thank you very much. Of course, I wish to thank all those of you who've spoken during our webinar. And in particular, I thank the researchers who've worked on this plan. I will focus on the political um, dimension as uh, Mr. Lai has also done, Mr. Vai. Now, Turkey is a very difficult friend. Let me use this expression. A friend because it is a country which is associated with the European Union. We have the uh, Customs Union and uh, it is a candidate for accession, even though the uh, procedure, the process has been frozen, as it were. And Turkey is also a, 
um, member of NATO, and it has always played a, a strategic role on the southern flank of NATO. So this is a country that is part of the two fundamental alliance systems that Italy is also a part of the European Union in in the way that it is related to it and nato but nonetheless it continues to be a difficult country a difficult friend as i was saying first of all because of where it is located because turkey is in a part of the world that uh, can be seen as uh, the the hinge the bridge between the north uh, and the south the east and the west and uh, the mediterranean region and the eurasian continent uh, this is where they all meet and there it is a meeting point for cultures religions civilizations and histories from constantinople all the way to now so just have a look at a map and you'll see what there is around Turkey. Around Turkey, we see uh, multiple conflicts and areas of instability. Because around Turkey, we've got Syria and we've got the Middle East with the Israeli-Palestinian conflict and we've got Lebanon. And around Turkey, we've got the Caucasian republics uh, and the, the Caucasus, and we've got the um, southern region of Russia. And of course, Cyprus in the Aegean Sea and we know that uh, uh, Turkey is an essential uh, country, uh, plays an essential role in the Eastern Mediterranean and uh, whatever Turkey does in that area is going to have an impact. And we saw this in the clash between Armenia and Azerbaijan. And we saw that Turkey uh, supported Azerbaijan and we saw what happened in Syria uh, with the military uh, operation in Northern Syria. And so their position is linked to another reason why it is a difficult to friend because of their policy. It is a hegemonic policy that is being pursued because they want to be viewed as a regional power. And from, the, from Libya to the uh, Balkans, from the Caucasus to Djibouti, all the way to the Aegean with Cyprus, we see that Turkey is pursuing this uh, hegemonic policy. And when the first military troops um, came uh, to Turkey, the Libyans, uh, Erdogan said, we're back to where we started. So this is uh, the role of Turkey uh, that we also saw in the Ottoman Empire and what we've seen uh, from Turkey over the centuries. And this is a point that we've always got to bear in mind because the great countries always have a history. They've, uh, and it is a legacy for them. They are proud of it. And that's how they want to be uh, recognized and acknowledged as, as a power, a great power. So Ataturk's Turkey, Um, had a role in the Euro in Europe in the 1900s after Versailles, after World War I. And its role was that of a strong and powerful country. But uh, it doesn't uh, forget uh, what it was before Versailles. And it was greater than what was uh, in fact decided in Versailles. So they do have this uh, history, uh, century old history. It is a, a nation a territory, a people that has it in its DNA. They've got uh, histories of imperial, uh, centuries of imperial history and uh, of this hegemonic power. And they uh, play on a huge exchequer. Um, and I think this all uh, counts. So we don't have DNA only in people. Uh, but peoples and nations also have a DNA. Great countries like Russia and Turkey and Iran when they um, interact, first of all, they want to be acknowledged as a power because of their legacy, because of their history. 
which they've acquired over time. So that is why I say Turkey is a difficult friend because of its uh, geographical position. It is a, a critical complex region where there are all sorts of uh, instability and conflicts. And it is a difficult friend because of the policy that is pursued by this country. Yet it is a country that Europe has to uh, take into account. And in fact, we've recaptured the different phases. There are two distinct and different phases in the relationship between, in the relations between the EU and Turkey. In the first phase, which began in 1960, uh, all the way up to the early 90s, we saw that the compass was pointing at uh, the uh, accession process. So with the association agreement, with the customs union, and uh, with uh, the um, stepping up of relations uh, and uh, the way in which their uh, accession application, as it were, was uh, favorably seen. And then the EU decided to shut its doors. Um, this was basically due to the fear of the public opinion. Uh, this began with Gusenbauer in Austria. He was the first to say that Turkey could no longer um, join the European Union. And then we had Chirac and then other countries. And uh, the group of countries that was in favor of uh, accession, uh, the group was smaller and smaller. Italy was always part of that group, but, but it was a minority group uh, compared to all the others. Now, when the EU uh, closed these doors, it resulted in a severe crisis in the Turkish leadership because they uh, were counting on uh, that outcome. And they even accepted a number of requests made by the European Union. And I'm thinking here of uh, the amendment to, to some of their criminal and civil codes and even their constitution. And I'm thinking of uh, uh, economic convergence policies. So um, clearly, that was uh, uh, frozen, was uh, blocked by the fact that the European Union decided to shut its doors. Now, the crisis in the Turkish leadership that I just referred to, and also that was at a time in which there was instability uh, politically in Turkey, and there was this uh, debate uh, between uh, po um, political parties, uh, uh, and each of these governments, uh, basically they were unstable because of this debate. And um, this resulted in a sentiment that became stronger with the AKP, AKP and, and other Turkish or Islamic parties. And Turkey therefore uh, looked elsewhere. So with uh, the European doors shut with no further prospects for accession, Turkey, and as I said earlier, Turkey is a country which is proud of its great history. So they didn't simply accept this no coming from Europe and they turned, they looked elsewhere. Uh, new prospects uh, is what they were interested in. And they wanted to uh, once again play an important role in the region. So they turned to the Islamic world. So Erdogan clearly is continuing to uh, pursue his goal as being a leader of the uh, Sunni world. And this is what is being done. The political axis has shifted for Turkey and even the cultural axis because uh, uh, it was a, a secular country uh, because uh, after Ataturk, one of the main features of Turkey was that it was a secular country, even though it was mixed 
uh, with uh, a strong authoritarianism because we know that there were dictatorships in the 70s in Turkey as well and in the 60s we know that so there was a mix there as well but uh, it was secular and that was a strong element a strong feature uh, even in the military in the military and in the in political uh, circles and then there was a total uh, upheaval a total change in terms of its cultural and political identity from within and there was a, a an islamic drift and therefore a repositioning a clear repositioning of their foreign policy and here turkey uh, decided to play the role of a regional power with this hegemonic design uh, neo-ottoman this is the neologism that was coined neo-ottoman profile so the migration phenomenon is part of this uh, big picture because uh, of course huge uh, arrivals uh, of migrants came into Turkey, not only from the Syrian conflict, however, because if we have a look at the uh, population comprising the refugees and migrants uh, hosted in um, these uh, camps, we see a lot of Syrians, but not only, because we also see people uh, coming from Asia, from Bangladesh, Pakistan, all the way over, and then we see um, people coming from the Near East and elsewhere. In any case, uh, it was a destination country for massive arrivals of refugees. So Turkey decided to uh, play its game, uh, to play its cards. They said to Europe, you shut your doors on us, so now you have to decide. You either uh, take us into account or I'm going to allow at least three million people uh, to come into Europe. People have spoken of blackmail and of, uh, you know, taking advantage of their position or whatever. You can use whatever name you like, but this is what happened. And Europe had to uh, come to grips with this because in turn, European Union was overwhelmed with the migration problem. European Union was unable to adopt a policy on migration, which was... Uh, mm, uh, different uh, from containment. I mean, that's all they were uh, focusing on, basically, on their external borders. So they said, uh, Turkey, you keep those migrants and we'll pay. We'll pay you for that. First, it was three billion. Now they renegotiated the agreement. So uh, with these uh, funds, we've got to change the camps. They have to be more civilized than what we saw in Libya, of course. That was one of the conditions. And uh, uh, a person of common sense uh, uh, must say, okay, in this uh, critical situation in which we are uh, with uh, migration management, uh, the situation in Turkey isn't uh, any worse than elsewhere, so let us support that agreement. But we've got to realize that the agreement is the um, result of the uh, very difficult relationship between Europe and the Euro and Turkey. So we have to uh, start uh, this reasoning process all over again between the EU and Turkey. And they shouldn't only focus on migration in this process. So as they decided in the latest meetings held by the foreign affairs ministers of the European Affairs Council on the 24th and 25th of June, just now, they have to uh, open up a channel for communication again, because they have to verify how they can possibly reestablish a relation I'm not saying that they want to resume the accession process, because I suppose it's uh, too difficult right now, but uh, we cannot just uh, shut out any relations and we cannot uh, only focus on migration. There has to be more to it than that. So Italy can play an important role because Italy is uh, an important partner for Turkey and vice versa. We're talking here about trade, investments, and strategic and political stability in the Eastern Mediterranean. So I think that this is what we need to focus on. This is where our effort has to be. 
and we can use the different instruments that we have. And I personally use the parliament. The parliament through parliaments, I've established uh, relations with the Foreign Affairs Committee of the Turkish Parliament, and on a regular basis. We have consultation sessions, we have debates, discussions on a number of issues. And my final remark is this. We know that Erdogan is one thing and Turkey is another. What do I mean by that? Well, I mean that we must never base our relations with a country only on uh, the leader at that moment, because two years ago, for example, in all Turkish cities, in all the cities in Turkey, the CHP won from uh, Istanbul to uh, Izmit, Albakir, Antalya, Mersin, Ankara, and so on and so forth, and all these different cities. Uh, so there is another Turkey out there. And I do think that they have a chance of taking over the leadership of the country because, I mean, even with Erdogan, uh, when you've been in power for 12 to 15 years, I mean, there comes a time when you either decide to end that or your voters uh, decide to do that. This is what happened to Netanyahu in Israel, and it happened to others as well. So I think that we've uh, got to look beyond uh, this point. We shouldn't only see Turkey um, on the basis of the fact that today there is this government uh, which is troubling, which is worrisome because of its policy, because it is a destabilizing policy. Now, clearly, we're not uh, challenging uh, the fact that a country can pursue its own foreign policy, but uh, if in doing so they destabilize uh, international balances, then perhaps that's not acceptable. And in fact, this is what the European Union said to Erdogan and what they keep saying. And quite rightly, so this is the uh, the setting that we're talking about. Now, going back to migration, I followed all your remarks, and I must say that uh, all that you've said is very, very interesting. You talked about the status, the legal status of these uh, refugees, and they have different kinds of status. We saw the tables on that, and we've heard about their living conditions, about their prospects. So, of course, and my very final uh, remark is this, this all takes us back uh, yet again to the European Union, because what kind of migration policy does the EU want to pursue? In the past few years, we've witnessed these massive arrivals of refugees and migrants, of course. And almost all the prime ministers of all political colors in all the different countries, they all used a hypocritical phase. I say a phrase, I say hypocritical. They say yes to refugees and no to economic migrants. That's a hypocritical, I say, because Europe, not only the union, but Europe, needs economic migrants. And the demographic dynamic shows this very clearly with the current birth rates that we have from now to the end of the century, the European continent, continental Russia included, will have 70 million inhabitants less than we have now. So an Italian demographer calculated what we're going to have to do in order to keep our current levels of economic productivity and social prosperity, taking into account this reduction in numbers. And the result was that we're going to have to keep increasing the retirement age of European citizens and allow them to retire only when they're 80 years old, but that's impossible. So. Either the European Union understands that we do have a refugee problem, but we also have a problem with economic migrants. We have to deal with that. We need a policy to manage this. We can have uh, humanitarian corridors for the refugees, and we can have legal arrivals that are negotiated for economic migrants on the basis of our reception um, capabilities and capacities and development trends and all of that. And that's how we can um, devise our policies. We cannot keep these people uh, forever in these camps along the borders. I mean, Denmark even suggested outrageously to set up these camps in Rwanda uh, without saying what we're going to do with those poor refugees in Rwanda. We're we going to keep them there for the rest of their lives. 
I mean, the only idea there is to keep them far from us because then we won't have any problems. No, that's not true because when a problem it exists, it'll exist wherever it is. So since we do have a migration problem, we either deal with it or it will continue to be a, uh, a mine that can blast off at any moment. So uh, we can talk about relocating people, resettling people, either internally or in northern Syria, in the Kurdish areas, is what they're saying. And we know how problematic that would be because these uh, relocations, uh, of course, are an anti-Kurdish move. Uh, it isn't so easy to do that. Uh, and it can certainly uh, give rise to more conflicts. So clearly, from all these different perspectives, migration is a key issue. So either the EU devises, crafts its policy, or this uh, situation will continue. Today, there were seven uh, deaths and nine uh, missing persons. Uh, we will continue to have these tragedies at sea, and it will it will no longer be uh, sufficient to hold these people in these camps. Uh, it will. Uh, I mean, 3 million people in Turkey, you can keep them for a while, but at some point you're going to have to give them some sort of a prospect for their future. I mean, we've got camps of Palestinians in Lebanon since 1948. I mean, there's, there's got to be a time limit to all this. So we've got to bear that in mind. Thank you. And hopefully I haven't taken up too much of your time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, in the meantime, uh, um, there is a, a sort of appeal. Uh, it's not linked to the to the issue of the uh, of today of Turkish, but is uh, linked to the issue of uh, instability. And, uh, and the, the, the people ask for uh, the possibility to open a, a humanitarian um, uh, space uh, um, for for children and women uh, injured by the war in Yemen. Uh, just an, an appeal that, uh, uh, and but uh, there, there is a question uh, to uh, Mr. Vai um, uh, regarding the estimating uh, estimation of an increase of new arrivals uh, after the COVID pandemic. And the question is, does Italy or Europe have any protection or a projection or preparation for a pos possible increase in, uh, in our arrivals? And there is a, uh, right now a question to Mr. Uh, Fassino um, about uh, uh, Italy, uh, Italy position in a possible change of government in Turkey. Uh, in the next election, um, despite all the uh, critics uh, um, regarding uh, human rights and democratic principles, uh, um, in Turkey under Erdogan, Erdogan's rule, he has been quite successful in controlling the resentment against refugees in Turkish society. What would be uh, if the new Turkish government would be more democratic than today's? Uh, well, it's linked, the question is linked between uh, democracy uh, and uh, uh, human rights and the, the feeling of the, uh, the people, of course, uh, uh, regarding the um, refugee issue. Uh, so I, I give the, uh, the floor to Lorenzo Vai and Piero Fassino just for a quick uh, answer. Uh, thank you. Uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you for the question. Because, uh, yeah, we are fully aware of the possible uh, post pandemic effects, uh, also regarding the increasing of migration flow um, coming from different routes, actually. So, Eastern, Central, Mediterranean, the Balkan routes, and so on and so forth. Uh, but to deal efficiently and effectively, effectively uh, with this uh, expected increase, the answer can be just one we have to work together at the EU level. Italy, Greece, Spain, Malta alone cannot face this challenge. Uh, past experiences uh, show it very well, I think. So the Italian position is, is, uh, is the same. I mean, since many years, we have to reform the EU migration framework, the EU legislation, 
we have to apply more solidarity between the member states, which means, for example, in one word, relocation, more financial uh, resources uh, um, to these countries, more involvement to take all together this structural challenge, because now we are talking about the implication of COVID-19, uh, the effects of the pandemic, but actually migration is a structural phenomenon. So it's not just the next one, two, three years, but it's for the future, for the next 10, 15 years. So we, we should bear this very important fact in mind when we talk about EU reform and how the European Union should take up this challenge. And when I say European Union, of course, I refer to all its member states. It's not easy. Uh, it's not easy at all. As we know, the EU uh, member states are divided on this topic. So this is the real political and diplomatic challenge to keep it, keep it up the debate between the EU institution, uh, trying to find a compromise. And I think that uh, we're working on that. And I hope that also uh, the next conference uh, for the future of Europe will be a good occasion to reopen again this very important dossier. Thank you. And Piero, do we want to... Ma, intanto. Well, I do agree with what uh, Mr. Avai has just said. And... Uh, he said something that people never bear in mind, and that is that migration is a structural phenomenon. It is not transitory, it is not temporary, it is not an emergency. Now, we've got to bear that in mind. If we try to ignore that, uh, uh, well, this is a huge mistake, and this is probably why we don't have a good migration policy. Because if we keep saying that we're just having to uh, patch up something that is going to go away, that's wrong. That's not uh, how it works. Uh, uh, migrations have always existed. So the sooner we realize that, the sooner we acknowledge that it is a structural phenomenon, and as soon as we understand all the demographic dynamics that I just referred to a moment ago, the sooner we do that, the better. Now, let me come to the question. First of all, let's clarify one point. A country has relations with other countries. Uh, considering the governments that are in power, I mean, this is a, a fundamental rule in diplomatic relations. So today we've got Erdogan and Italy has relations with Turkey uh, through Erdogan uh, debating, negotiating with the government that is uh, in power right now. And it is not up to the Italian government to uh, hope to see another government or to work for that uh, goal. Um, this is not part of uh, uh, what happens in relations between states. So the Erdogan government is there and that's the government that we have relations with today. What I said was different. I said, be careful because uh, we, when we look at Turkey, we shouldn't only consider the Erdogan government, we should look at a broader uh, political scenario and the uh, prospect that there might be a, a different government uh, one day that is less destabilizing and that is uh, more open-minded uh, when it comes to Europe. Uh, but that's my assessment, that's my hope um, when it comes to institutional relations, clearly Italy uh, has its relations with the Erdogan government. Now, when I say that we entertain relations with the government, we also have to assess the policies that are pursued. For example, uh, in our debate, uh, we didn't uh, uh, look into the Kurdish uh, issue, except for one brief mention that I made. In the past few weeks in Turkey, there is uh, something going on that's not trivial at all. At the Supreme Court, there is a proceeding for the dissolution of the so-called Kurdish party, even though that's not its official name. Now, you realize, uh, I'm sure, that if they decide uh, to do that, the relation between the EU and Turkey, and uh, between Italy and Turkey, uh, will be running into another obstacle. And I hope that doesn't happen. I myself uh, told my interlocutors in Turkey, I keep relations with them, I told them about the risks that they run with that kind of decision. And we mustn't ignore 
that after the coup d'etat in 2016 in Turkey, there was a, a tightening up of the uh, judicial system, uh, the media, uh, some of the public administrations, and that also um, created concern all over Europe because it was seen as an autocratic um, decision. So when things like that occur, uh, concerns have to be voiced because international relations are also based on sincerity, on honesty. The, on, the more you are honest, the more you can have a, a dialogue, even though there might be criticism in this dialogue. So we have to uh, take into account the government that is there, as I said, and as I've reiterated, we have to understand what Turkey is, what how important it is, what its history is, what the sentiment is in its people. So those are all issues that we have to take in mind. It would be wrong for us not to, but we must also uh, express our uh, concerns and our troubles, which perhaps are not conducive to open and cooperative relations between EU and Turkey. Uh, Io terminato, eh? okay. I've concluded my remarks, thank you. Okay, uh, I think there are no more uh, questions. Uh, before finishing, uh, can you allow me just to say a few sentences before finishing, if it's possible? Uh, because actually it has been a very fruitful debate and I once more uh, thank uh, all the CSP team, uh, Daniela, Valeria, Aurora, and of course uh, the director, uh, Mr. Fasino and Lorenzo, and of course Meral who wrote this wonderful report. Uh, on the freight funds and we, as she also said it is really difficult because uh, access to information on the uh, funding and the financial aspects is very complicated uh, but what i want to underline before finishing actually i believe that this whole migratory challenges are uh, creating new um, doubts uh, between turkey and europe uh, and uh, such kind of collaborations between civil society organizations, think tanks, research centers is really very important because uh, we are, uh, let's say, in, a, in one of the bottom points of Turkey-EU relations uh, due to many different uh, issues. But these uh, possibilities of discussing together, presenting our ideas, I believe is very important because the history doesn't, will not end today, thanks God. And uh, for a better future, we should uh, continue to work together to collaborate and to, um, uh, uh, to, to think together for a better future. Thank you very much. Thank you, Didem. Actually, you just took the, the words out of my mouth because I was about to say the same, you know, keeping this collaboration and sort of uh, diplomacy people to people, think tank towards the tank is a, a very important tool in order to keep Turkey connected to Europe and in order to elaborate something fruitful. And I, I do believe in Turkey is already dinner time, if not, it has passed yet. So uh, Better to close here our session. We put a lot of food of thought on the table again, and I'm sure it will be the beginning, uh, the beginning of further discussion and further cooperation within uh, the frame of Observatory on Turkey by CESPI. And I would like to thank you for your participation, Meral, once again, for your uh, wonderful uh, contribution to the panel and to the, to the project. And many thanks to Meral. A special thank to Mr. Lorenzo Valle, to Piero Fassino, the, the chairman of CESPI and uh, the Foreign Affairs Committee of uh, the Italian Parliament. And uh, again, once again, Chokte Shikure Diorus, and uh, we wish all the best. I mean, on the frame of Turkey EU relations, Italy will be always a good friend, as we has been pointed out, of Turkey. And uh, I hope to see you again and being a member of the, some other projects. And I mean, to see face to face despite the, the limits posed by the pandemic, actually. 
Uh, Daniele, I will close here the session. Do you want to say something else? No, just thank you, everyone. And uh, no, see you as soon as possible <laughs> in, a, in, a new, in a new opportunity. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Bye.